this emergency briefing today to condemn violence by federal agents against nonviolent civil protest in Portland and to unite for a call for de-escalation for all violence against civilians and nonviolent civil protesters. This violence must cease. In the next hour, we will hear why resisting these federal tactics in Portland is a national struggle with relevance, relevance for every other community. And we will learn about concrete actions to protect democratic practice and demonstrate solidarity with the city of Portland. Thank you all who are joining us via Zoom and Facebook Live, civil society leaders across the country, as well as invited reporters. Thank you to our co-sponsors of today's briefing, Common Cause, the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA, People's Action, Race Forward, Southern Poverty Law Center, the Oregon AFL-CIO, and the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. We also thank our esteemed panel of speakers, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, Martin O'Brien of the Social Change Initiative, Catalina Cruz, New York Assemblywoman, and Reverend Dr. Emma Jorda Simpson of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and Margaret Hong, Southern Poverty Law Center's President and CEO. A little housekeeping. The briefing will be recorded and available by request. Due to our limited time frame, our audience is muted and off video throughout the briefing. We do not have a question and answer. The chat function will not be available, but for any reporters on the call interested in following up, please drop us a line at press at wscpdx.org. Before I introduce Senator Merkley to kick us off, I want to provide a little context for today's briefing. Three years ago, I left a very comfortable job in philanthropy and a great group of friends in Brooklyn, New York to return to the Pacific Northwest because I knew a moment was coming. White nationalism was on the rise and a person was in the White House who was capable of turning our democracy into an authoritarian state. I had the sense that once again, the Pacific Northwest would be a proving ground for the fight between an inclusive version of democracy one that's, and one that sought to roll back the gains of the 20th century civil rights movement. And here we are in the center of that very fight. Let me read to you briefly from the lawsuit we filed yesterday concerning the rights of the people of Portland in the face of the federal government that while extolling the nation's founders and statues erected to them, ignores the history and laws that established the federal government in the first place. The Bill of Rights to the United States Constitution protects liberty in its 10th Amendment by allocating powers between the federal government on one hand and the states and the people on the other. Every power that the Constitution does not specifically grant to the federal government or forbid to the states is reserved to the states and to the people. That mattered to the founders and the framers of our constitution and it matters on the streets of Portland right now. Indeed, the president himself on the 4th of July at Mount Rushmore described the constitutional structure that the framers created as the culmination of thousands of years of Western civilization and the triumph not only of spirit but of wisdom, philosophy, and reason. Unwilling to accept the framers' constitutional constraints on his power, the president last week fulfilled his promise to deploy militarized federal law enforcement personnel to quote, quickly solve for local authorities the supposed problem that had descended upon Portland. Though sent in the guise of intending to bring order to Portland streets, their arrival has made things much worse for Portlanders. I have to tell you, I have never been prouder to be a Portlander. I want you to hear now from two fellow Oregonians who are leaders in our fight for inclusive democracy. 
before we hear how this looks to our allies across the country. After our panelists share their views, I'll tell you more about the opportunities that we see for your involvement. Now I'm delighted to kick off our lineup of esteemed panelists with my Senator from Oregon, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. Senator Merkley has dedicated his long career in public service for fighting for economic justice and opportunity for Oregon families. He is a principled advocate of healthcare access, public education, and LGBTQ equality. He has been outspoken in Congress to prohibit the kind of federal overreach we are experiencing right now in Portland. Thank you for joining us, Senator Merkley. Director Ward, thank you so much for inviting me to join the panel and for the Western States uh, Conference to uh, pull things together in this, this fashion. This is such an important conversation. We are witnessing an unprecedented attack on fundamental civil rights of Americans, the right to assemble, the right to free speech. And it's being attacked in a manner we have not seen before. We have a president who has admired the strong arm tactics of dictators around the world from those in places like Turkey and in Russia and in the Philippines. And now he has brought those secret police tactics right to the streets of America. What we have seen is the deployment of federal forces with no identification as to what organization they belong to, no unique identifier, which is extremely important to make sure that uh, forces do not conduct themselves in an inappropriate uh, fashion. We have seen that they have expanded beyond the mission of protecting a federal property to roaming the streets of Portland, grabbing people at will, throwing them onto unmarked vans. And then we have the fact that they were deployed uh, with uh, strategies of direct assault on peaceful protesters. We have seen a Navy veteran simply standing and wanting to ask folks, are you honoring the Constitution? And instead he was beaten by three Customs and Border Protection officers, two of them beating him with, bat with batons while a third pepper sprayed him in the face. We've seen a young protester who was simply standing holding what looked like a radio over his head and then you see him crumple and collapse, shot straight between the eyes at pretty close range, fractured skull. He was in the hospital in critical condition. I gather he's doing better now, thankfully. But these examples of a secret police operating in a brutal manner against peaceful protesters is in every conceivable way unacceptable in our country. I'm pleased to say that the congressional delegation has done a number of things. We have called for an inspector general investigation in the two departments responsible, Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. We have asked the myriad questions in writing and in direct conversations about these, these practices, trying to get to the, the bottom of how all this was planned and, and executed. We have called for the departure of these forces, immediate departure of their forces uh, from our city. Uh, we have uh, proceeded to put forward a bill, uh, and I say we, Senator Wyden and I together in the Senate, now backed in the last two days by, by more than 40 other senators, putting an end to secret police deployments in the United States of America. Now, this isn't something just about Portland. This was about the president sending folks deliberately trying to create the biggest possible violent confrontation. And then for the president to give a campaign speech saying he is a law and order president. Law and order president deliberately creating chaos in the streets of America. I don't think Americans will buy this for one second. Then the president said he loved these tactics so much he wants to expand them to Baltimore, to Philadelphia, to New York, to Detroit, to Chicago, to Oakland. And he made a point of saying places controlled by electeds who are, happen to be uh, Democrats. So a partisan warfare with secret police on the streets of America, we have to end this. And I'm so pleased that we have advocates in Oregon, like the commissioner, who will, I'll now hand the baton to. Thank you, Senator Merkley. Now I'm excited to allow you all to get a chance to hear from my friend, Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty. 
Joanne has lived her commitment to a people-centered, transparent, and accountable government over decades of public service in elected roles across local and state government. Also a Navy veteran, Joanne's past community leadership roles include the president of the NAACP's Portland branch and executive director of Oregon Action. Joanne has led policing reforms in Portland uh, for nearly three decades. Joanne Hardesty, welcome commissioner. Thank you for joining us this morning. Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, thank you, Senator Merkley. Thank you, uh, Eric Ward. Um, all of us go back a long, long way uh, working in Portland to ensure the civil rights of every community member. Um, let me start by saying Portland police have consistently lied to the public. They've lied to our congressional delegation about whether or not they were coordinating activities with this federal secret police force. Uh, we just found out this week after six weeks of being told that there was no coordination, uh, that in fact there was a Homeland Security person embedded in a Portland Police Emergency Command Center from day one. Uh, what we know is those of us who have been around for a while, we know that police use tactics of putting um, uh, plainclothes uh, provocateurs into crowds, peaceful protest crowds, to justify police over response. I want to let the rest of the world know that the problem in Portland was the over excessive use of force by Portland police officers or nonviolent protesters. If one or two people threw a water bottle at a police officer clad head to toe in riot gear, it does not justify gassing hundreds of people in an entire community because a police officer had their feelings hurt. The reality is, is that people are on the street all over the United States honoring George Floyd because George Floyd was just the latest, not the last, not the first, that the public has seen brutalize and die at the hands of an over aggressive police force. The police are losing the public narrative and uh, 45, because I just can't put president and the name in the same sentence, um, has sent in troops that we traditionally send to other black and brown countries to brutalize their community members. And here are now using those people in, a, in, in local communities, in urban centers. I read yesterday that the acting Homeland Security Director specifically picked Portland for two reasons. I led the effort to pull Portland out of the Portland Joint Tourism Task Force it's the first thing I did when I got to the city council because my community is extremely concerned about police working closely with ICE and other federal agencies. The second thing that on the list was, you may remember two years back, there was a protest at ICE and the federal government asked Portland police to participate and they said no. And so those were the two reasons other than the fact that the quote unquote Portland is out of control. Portland was never out of control. Portland's police overreacted, which gave 45 permission to send in these unarmed troops. Now imagine we have had people, when I led a protest on Friday, I led a rally on Friday, right on the steps of the Justice Center. We had over 2000 people. We organized it in less than five hours. There were people of all stripes. There were seniors with mobility devices, children in the crowd. 10 minutes after I left, these thugs hired by 45 to come in um, actually released these military grade tear gas canisters and threw them everywhere. So if you see the news at night, you see these pictures of orange clouds in the sky. And so think about Portland Place using tear gas um, and then these, uh, uh, these unidentified secret police force using military grade tear gas. Remember guys, we're all still in the middle of a pandemic. And we know that the first uh, a symptom is to attack the respiratory system. Now, uh, 45 couldn't send us money for COVID testing. 
couldn't send us money uh, to help people stay in their homes, um, could not send us money uh, for people who are unemployed, but he can send in a military force with military equipment because $50,000 of damage was done to a federal courthouse. I don't know about you guys, but I've never known graffiti to be a federal crime. And I have never heard the term violent graffiti before I heard it out of the mouth of the acting um, Homeland Security Director. Let me be clear, this is, uh, this is happening because A, police in general are losing the public debate. They are accustomed to setting the narrative. They're accustomed to telling us where the crime is happening, who's committing crime, and whose fault it is, and how much money they need. Now that we have this national movement on defunding police, abolishing police, this is the, the pushback. And first, uh, Portland police were extremely aggressive because they were angry that people are demanding that we abolish the police. Now they have this additional help with these goons that uh, 45 sent to Portland. And they absolutely are targeting places where the community is demanding reform and demanding that we disarm, defund, um, and, and totally change how policing works in America. That's what we're up against. I can tell you I've never been prouder to be a Portlander because after mothers, nurses, teachers, children were gassed, uh, the next day we had a thousand people on the street and, uh, and uh, the moms group. And the day after that, 2000. And so what, what 45 doesn't understand about Portland is that you try to intimidate us we will use all the peaceful means we have to stand our ground. You may gas us today, but we'll be back tomorrow and we'll be standing up for the constitution. This is about constitutional right to demand changes from your government. And we now have somebody in the highest office that thinks that they can send armed troops to intimidate, uh, brutalize and disappear community members. And let me also say, who do you think they're grabbing up off the street? They are targeting communities that are sanctuary cities uh, that have made it um, a safe, we thought, for people who don't have documentation. I asked the mayor, uh, who do you think they're grabbing off the street? Well, uh, 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 I said, uh, he says, well, uh, a sanctuary city just means we don't work with ICE. And I said, well, who do you think the border patrol works with, right? So we have, a, um, we have an ignorance at the highest levels in our city government, uh, people who just assume that if the police say it happened, it really happened. I want people to know, I do not believe that there are any protesters in Portland that are starting fires, that are creating chaos. I absolutely believe that it is police action and they are sending sabotages and provocateurs into peaceful crowds so that they can justify their inhumane treatment of people who are standing up for their right. I'll stop there, because as Eric knows, I could talk all day about this stuff. Uh, is that enough, Eric? Want something else? Thank you, Portland Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you for speaking with us today, stepping away from your meetings uh, to, to give us insight on what's happening on the community level in Portland. But thank you for your leadership right now. You are very welcome. Let me just say, I'm gonna reach out to the Chicago mayor later today. I'm getting calls from all over the country. And as you talk to people, tell them we are happy to share any information, any strategy, any tactic, because it is my belief that if they can silence Portland, um, there will be a move to stop the elections because uh, we will have our dictator in charge and we have to do everything we can to make sure we protect our democracy. So thank you all. Thank you for having this emergency meeting and don't hesitate. We are here ready. We will continue to fight in Portland and we will help you prepare for it. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to my colleague, Martin O'Brien, uh, who is the director of the Social Change Initiative. Martin uh, is based in Belfast, Ireland and worked for 11 years at Atlantic Philanthropies, including as the senior vice president. He has extensive international experience in human rights advocacy, 
peace building and conflict resolution, including leading the committee on the administration of justice, which campaigned locally and internationally to advance human rights in Northern Ireland. Martin, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Eric. And I suppose I want to um, begin by saying that I'm absolutely honored to have been asked um, to join the call today by my friend, Eric. And anybody who knows Eric knows that it's probably a fairly brave person who might say no to him if he asks you to, uh, if he asks you to do something. So um, I'm delighted to be with you today. And I've only visited Portland once, and it was 35, 30, 35 years ago. And it was to attend a conference on nonviolent direct action. And I suppose it's no surprise to me now to see that nonviolent protest is alive and well in Portland. But that was my first and only connection with Portland. And as I say, it was 30 and 35 years ago. So I'm pleased to be with you today. And as Eric has said, I'm joining you from Belfast in Northern Ireland. And we, as many of you will know, have had our own problems over the years. And I have uh, worked here on issues of peace building, nonviolence and human rights. And I suppose I want to start by expressing my very deep regret at what um, people in Portland are having to endure. And also to assure you of the solidarity and support of very many people of goodwill here in Ireland who are watching what's going on and who are deeply, um, deeply distressed. And I suppose we're keen to learn more about what's happening. And we're also keen to do what we can to amplify your voice internationally, but also to see if there are ways that we can help. Um, and I suppose, you know, anyone who around the world who's committed to fairness and to human rights and to the rule of law must be deeply, deeply concerned at the scenes in Portland. Uh, you know, as Senator Merkley has uh, already pointed out, unidentifiable government agents running amok, violating the rights of individuals, using disproportionate and indiscriminate force is never acceptable. But it's particularly troubling in the context when it's being used as a tactic to try to quell nonviolent protest. Now, of course, the tactic, as um, the commissioner pointed out, the tactic isn't working and that it won't work. It won't quell nonviolent protest. If anything, it will feed and fuel it. However, unless it's challenged, it risks establishing a very dangerous precedent. And if those involved get away with it in Portland, where will it happen next? And so globally, I think people are concerned about this and should be concerned about this because it's happening to people in Portland but also because it can happen in other places. And of course, it can also happen to us. And that is what we all need to bear in mind, the interconnectedness and how what one person does and one leader does in one place is quickly copied by people all over the world. So this should, I think, very much be something that we are all concerned about. From our own experience here in Northern Ireland, it's essential that those who are meant to enforce the law are held to account when they break it. And it's no accident that these agents in Portland are unidentifiable. It's part of a global pattern when law officers want to evade accountability for things which they know they're doing that are wrong. So it's not, it's not a, an accident that suddenly unique identifiers go. It's a deliberate strategy and a deliberate plan. And I think it's our job to ensure that accountability is felt at individual, institutional, and political level. Accountability is at the heart of any society that aims to be civilized. So recording what's happening, relentlessly following up, litigating all of the things that you are already doing are really the key to accountability, and they are the engine for change. I want to very briefly just share a little bit about the experience of policing power and protest in Northern Ireland. And no two places are the same, and, uh, but there may be some kind of resonance. And I suppose the thing that 
strikes me most having been through, you know, some similar scenes here um, is, is really that we really need to be very alert to how quickly things can escalate outside our control and well beyond any consequences that we have ever contemplated. So this is a profoundly dangerous situation to be in when you actually have this kind of thing going on because it's all so easily escalates beyond the, ex the, the consequences that anybody could imagine. And we've had very, very sad and tragic experience of that in, in our place. And so I just think everybody needs to be very alert to that. The other thing which I think is relevant is that complexity and nuance quickly give way to the divisive simplification of them and us and mutually exclusive narratives. And we can already see, I think, the vilification and false labeling being used in an effort to marginalize and dismiss the legitimate rights of protesters in Portland. So there's a narrative which is going, which is vilifying, demonizing, and all of that's about marginalizing. So there are these competing narratives. And I think the them and us narratives take everyone really into a dead end and limit the space for dialogue and understanding. So I would say avoid them if you can. It's not easy, but it, it seems to me we need to be very sensitive to the narrative and the way we engage with the issues. It's important to keep lines of communication open with as many local stakeholders as possible and that the base remains inclusive of those most adversely impacted by the current situation. So who's at the, at the toughest end of this? And are those people still connected into the movement and the actions? So I think really important to keep connected with all the stakeholders. Um, one of the things that we found here in the Northern Ireland experience was that when the going gets tough, hopefully others in positions of power are prepared to stand beside you. And as the scenes unfold to me, looking at them from here, it seems to me that the time for that has come where more powerful influential people need to be out there because and, and why do i say that i say that because the, their presence can cause the authorities to think twice about the consequences of their action and that's what's really needed now something that gets um people to think twice about the consequences of going out and tear gassing people indiscriminately using indiscriminate and uh, um excessive force some people disproportionate force um, if, if there are lots of powerful and influential people there, people begin to think a little more about that. And I don't know to what extent that's happening already, but I, I, looking at this from a distance, I see it escalating. And I think that is something that everybody needs to think about how to, um, how to begin to get some restraint on this absolutely reckless mad behavior of people who appear really to be out of control. Um, and I think sometimes even the people who order them in don't realize that they can very quickly get out of control. Um, so, you know, there are different theories about this, whether it's all planned, whether it's all ordered, whether it's all directed. My concern is that regardless of all of that, when things kick off, control disappears. And these, these don't look to me like disciplined people. Um, far from it. Um, and so one of the priorities, it would seem to me, is to try to think of ways in which some kind of um, constraint can be placed on that behaviour. Finally, I suppose I want to say that there is, I think, an added responsibility to work to ensure that nonviolence delivers. Um, that's a very important aspect of all of that. And to do this, I think, requires medium and longer term planning that takes account for shifting scenarios, worst cases, best cases, and begins to try to factor that in over and above the short term focus of what's going to happen today. And that's easier said than done in the, in the heat of the moment. But I think in order to um, ensure that nonviolence delivers, um, that's particularly important that people think about the medium and the longer term, about what all of this is about. And again, I'm sure people are all doing that already. There's no rocket science in any of this. And um, really, I just want to stop and there and to assure you once again of the support and solidarity of people here in Ireland. And 
and we're eager to find out ways that we can help. And I suppose we have some degree of empathy because we have seen these kinds of things on our own streets and we have been involved in trying to restrain those through mountain observer operations and all kinds of things to really look at how policing in its broadest terms um, takes place. We've had the army, we've had special agents, we've had the police, we've had this whole range of things and very, very, very sad consequences from it, but also some interesting stories of, of change, particularly around things like the unidentified. I mean, it just seems to me to be such an outrage that you can be beaten like that by somebody and nobody can be held accountable because they because we can't identify who it was who did it. Absolutely outrageous. So I'll stop there and um, thank you again for inviting me and including me and I'm eager to hear more from, from others. Martin, thank you so much for your voice and thank you for uh, your work over the years. And, and I hope that soon we have a chance to, to uh, learn from colleagues in Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, more. And uh, we will let those who, who are participating today uh, know more information about that. Next, I'd like to introduce New York Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz. Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz represents New York State's Assembly's 39th district, which is one of the most diverse districts in the country. Uh, I, I have to say, so she doesn't give me a hard time, that is uh, also includes Queens. Um, and Assemblywoman Cruz was born in Colombia and came to Queens at the age of nine as a dreamer with her mother. She's an experienced attorney and a leader for tenant protections immigration reform and workers' rights. She has helped New York become a national leader in the fight against worker exploitation and human trafficking. I'm excited for Assembly Member Cruz to share the innovative policy calls she is leading in New York State to stop state violence in Portland, Oregon. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you so much for having me. Can everybody hear me well? Wonderful. All right, fantastic. So. I I want to start by saying first, thank you for convening this very important conversation. Often a lot of what we have to struggle with as elected leaders in our own backyards um, doesn't get national attention, but to know uh, and, and at least to get an opportunity to support folks outside of our own circle uh, when they're struggling, it's very important because it allows us to unfortunately envision what if it happens here and what do I need to do to help them so that it doesn't get into my backyard. Um, the reason I mentioned that is also because um, as Eric mentioned, I grew up in Colombia. What's happening right now happened in Colombia in the 80s and the 90s and it's still happening every day where uh, civil rights are violated, where human rights are violated, where people are disappeared, where you have a secret police that no one knows who they are because that's the whole point of it being secret that comes and takes people um, away. Um, I had family members that that happened to, uh, family members that were fighting for civil rights, for students' rights. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with the history of Colombia in the 80s, it was a very big thing to fight for students' rights, for human rights, and to have the police show up at your house, show up at your block, show up at your protest and disappear you for a couple of days until you learned your lesson. Why is it that we come to the so-called country of hope, the country where immigrants are supposed to be protected, the country where our civil rights are supposed to be paramount because the constitution says that no matter the color of your skin, I mean, it doesn't say that literally, but we know that it says that, that no matter the color of your skin, your immigration status, who you are, you are supposed to be protected and there are certain rights that are not supposed to go away because someone is in the White House who doesn't respect them. And so my particular district happens to not only have um, the most diverse community in the country, uh, we speak more than 150 languages, but we also have the highest number of undocumented Americans in the state which means my community has been dealing with the fear of somebody showing up at their door for as long as they can remember. What's happening in Portland now, which by the way, I was in Portland about a year ago, um, and it pains me to now hear this, is 
this, these stories, a mixture between somebody showing up at your door and your government disappearing or your government simply infringing upon your right and hiding behind a president. Um, and, 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 um, and I like the commissioner earlier, I actually want to say that I want to say he's the president because we need to be reminded who is there so we can get him out. But that's a conversation for another day. And so what I want to uh, highlight is communities like mine are, are, are very vulnerable. We have the kind of people who felt protected because we were a quote unquote a sanctuary city. I helped write actually the bill that got ice out of Rikers when I was a lawyer for the city council. And for me to now have to see this happening in a sister community like Portland is, um, it's frankly heartbreaking and we couldn't just sit and do nothing. And so I do wanna give a shout out um, to uh, Common Cause and um, their leader for bringing us uh, this initiative of, of not only writing a letter and seeking the support of my colleagues in the assembly and the Senate, um, but helping us make sure that we're making the right kind of noise. Because what happens is when you don't make noise, when you allow this behavior to go unchecked, it'll go from Portland to Los Angeles, to everywhere in Texas, to Arizona, to New York. And one day it ends up in every single one of our cities. And before we know it, we are just as bad as Columbia in the 80s and 90s and right now. And so to think that it's only in Colombia, no. I have neighbors who are coming from Bangladesh where the same thing was happening. These are the kinds of behaviors that the majority of immigrants who are not wanted in this country were fleeing in the first place. This is the kind of thing that's meant to instill fear. This is about nothing else other than fear. And so if we don't stay quiet, if we make enough noise, if we involve the right kind of people, if we bring it international with Martin and other folks who can support this work, we are hopefully gonna get to stop this behavior. And while it was the president who has been supporting this behavior, I want us to not forget that these agencies existed before he came along have existed while he's here and will exist when he leaves, hopefully, when he leaves. And so we also have to keep that in mind and advocate to our federal electeds to check the agencies, to check the budget of those agencies, to check the behavior of those agencies. Because without that, we're back at square one with a different president who may one day think that it's okay to use those powers in that way. So that is what basically our proposal, our letter is seeking to do, to have our federal electeds take action, hold the agencies accountable, hold their feet to the fire and make sure that no matter who's sitting in the White House, agencies are not left to go unchecked and, and behave this way and infringe on our rights this way. I can talk about more for them. But as long as an agency like ICE, as long as an agency like the CIA, as long as agencies like that exist in the way that they are now, you are in danger, I am in danger, my rights and my neighbor's rights are in danger. So if we want a country that truly protects all of us, no matter the color of our skin, our gender, our immigration status, and actually stands for every single promise, in the constitution, then our federal electeds need to act. Because I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but I am a state elected official and it is my job to protect my community and this is what I'm going to do. But I need my colleagues in the federal legislature to do the job that we elected them to do. Because it isn't just about tweeting something. It isn't just about standing at a press conference, hold their feet to the fire and get them to stop. Because it's Portland today It'll be New York tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. I want to now turn to um, and introduce Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson, Executive Director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA, the, the US branch of the oldest international interfaith peace and justice organization 
employing the transformative power of nonviolence to resolve human conflict. She is the executive pastor of the Concord Baptist Church of Christ and president of the American Baptist Churches of Metropolitan New York. Reverend Jordan Simpson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric. And I also agreed it's very hard to say no uh, to Eric Ward. Um, I am, um, I don't wanna say uh, glad, I, but I am appreciative that um, you called on us and that we are participating in this conversation um, today. I'm sitting here thinking as we are all talking, uh, it just feels so familiar in other ways. My earliest memories are of state-sponsored violence. Like those images are burned into my psyche. We are a traumatized people. And we have been that much more traumatized uh, in the last three years. And I feel like my worst nightmare is coming um, true. It feels like um, a nightmare because the federal government is um, leashing and promising to unleash even more uh, violence and firepower on its own cities. If you will remember, if we will all remember after 9-11, fear caused us to concentrate and consolidate so much power into what I call America's new church, the Department of Homeland Security. And I say that it's a church because war is America's religion and militarization is our spiritual discipline. Um, but we concentrated all of this power into the Department of Homeland Security against the warnings of so many uh, people who said that we would eventually turn this power onto our own people. And after spending an obscene amount of money for years, um, evangelizing local police forces across the country, sharing military grade uh, toys and costumes and weapons, here we are, here we are. And so, on behalf of FOR's 100 years of work, I wanna be here today to add my voice to everyone here and to implore us to take this moment seriously. This is not a test. If it is successful here, it will be evangelized across the country. There had, I'm, I'm very mindful that there has never been um, a time when we didn't have to struggle. There's never been a time um, when uh, it was easy. Um, and so how we fight matters, how we struggle matters. And so from the radical union organizing in the early 20th century to the first freedom ride in the 1940s to the heart of the civil rights movement to solidarity movements, um, with our international partners, even to the recent uprisings in Ferguson and Baltimore and elsewhere, the adoption of principled nonviolence increases the likelihood for a healing centered framework to emerge in the aftermath of conflict, a framework of healing led by marginalized peoples leading uh, to a more lasting and uh, systemic change. And I wanna say that the, the object, um, the goal is not de-escalation. The goal is creating a space for people to come together to pursue the goals of democracy and justice. And if there is anyone that we want to issue the call to, to de-escalate, it is the federal government. We want the federal government to de-escalate. We want them uh, to stand down. Um, I, I want to just end um, on this, um, this question that I want all of us to, to keep asking, uh, because this is the other level of my nightmare. We have to ask by what authority are these camouflaged men with their guns and their unmarked vehicles uh, kidnapping people? And if it turns out that the federal agent in plain clothes or camouflage 
who was doing the grabbing in Portland today, tomorrow we will be contending with civilians in camouflage. We will be contending with vans pulling up. And just like what they did with Ahmad Aubrey, who was you know, in running shoes, uh, jogging, we will have civilians doing the same thing. Who are these men who put their guns in their track in their in their trucks, um, with marked with these Confederate uh, rebel flags, um, and 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 who are whose actions are being sanctioned by the highest levels um, of our government? So, by whose authority are we allowing this kind of thing? Um, uh, to, to happen, and what in the world do we think is going to happen tomorrow if we don't do something about it? And so at the same time that we are telling the government to de-escalate, I also want to say something else to those who are working um, for the government in all levels, for police and for the government in all levels. I want to say that um, being employed by the government um, um, you, you can make a decision. You can say that I no longer wish to feed my family on income that I have earned by unleashing violence, choosing to protect property over people. That's a, that's a hard call, but you can make that decision. You have the power to withdraw your cooperation from violence. That's how tyrants and despots are uh, uh, toppled. You have the power to withdraw, to join with the people and to withdraw your cooperation um, uh, from this violence. And I, I, I wanna remind us, you know, that the, the ACLU was born because uh, people needed help to withdraw their cooperation from war and from violence and to stand up in their full humanity and say that they would not be conscripted um, into killing and just like we did it then to help people find pathways out of this, then we can do the same thing uh, now. This moment in time um, is not a test. And I want us to be very clear who we are talking to when we say uh, to employ uh, nonviolence. From what I can see, you know, 55 days out there in the streets, uh, people are trying to be principled in their nonviolence. What we have is an unprincipled government, and we cannot trust this government to do anything other than what it is doing right now, which is to unleash more and more and more of this violence because of a political agenda. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what I want to uh, share um, right now. I think we need to all take a deep breath. <laughs> and we need to keep asking ourselves and in this in this picture, you know, who's being violent? Who is being violent? Because I can tell you right now, people across the globe who have all um, uh, in the fed up rising, you know, who, who are standing up right now, people are very clear about what violence is. Violence is throwing a political party on indigenous lands. Violence is refusing to, to handle your leadership responsibility, your federal leadership responsibility, and saying to states, you have to deal with the rising death tolls uh, in, your, in your states because of COVID-19. Uh, violence is uh, not being able to feed your family in the richest country uh, in the world. Let us be very clear about who is violent here. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Jordan Simpson. So powerful. I now wanna to turn to our last speaker, Margaret Hong, President and CEO of Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, Margaret has championed social justice and human dignity, advocating against discrimination and oppression in all of its forms. Prior to joining the Southern Poverty Law Center, Margaret served as executive director of Amnesty International USA. Margaret, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Eric, for including me in this wonderful conversation. I've really been lucky to hear from my colleagues first. And I want to thank the Western States Center for lifting this issue up to the national and international level. 
I think it's critically important that we have these discussions. As many of you will know, each year since 1990, the Southern Poverty Law Center has published an annual census of hate groups operating within the United States. This number is just one barometer of the level of hate activity in the country. And the hate map that we produce annually actually is the result of a year of monitoring by our analysts and researchers representing activity by hate groups for the last year. Since Trump's election, Portland has been one of the cities that the SPLC has been monitoring because of violence in the streets and threats by the far right. Those behind these actions have rooted their rallying cries in nativism, in racism, in religious bigotries, and in bigotry toward the LGBTQIA community. Threatening the residents of Portland, far-right activists have painted the city as harboring terrorists, ones that must, a city that has to be reclaimed, they claim, through force. This has all been done in an attempt to validate a central desire of those in the far right to commit violence against their opposition while broadly accusing their opposition of being the true aggressor. These ideas are viral and they encourage others to menace any and all progressive programs for peace and equity in the country. The fact that DHS is validating these far-right extremist narratives really promotes the necessity of violence against political opposition. President Trump laid the groundwork for the actions we're witnessing in Portland years ago when he first encouraged and applauded violence carried out by his supporters against counter demonstrators at his campaign rallies. Back in 2016, his most violent supporters followed Trump into rallies and he cheered them on. Some paramilitary groups followed that. And over recent days in Portland, the DHS is now seemingly following them in turn. The unconstitutional violence orchestrated in Portland by this administration through the DHS may actually inspire more violence against law enforcement that originates from within the far right's anti-government movement. We have seen this in California and in Nevada in recent plots and attacks carried out against law enforcement from within the Boogaloo movement. The DHS may be misunderstanding this threat. What has happened over the last few months and days is that sectors of the anti-government movement have found fuel for both their messages and their rage in the militarized violence that has been employed by law enforcement in response to black activists protesting the murders of black people by police and vigilantes. It's worth noting that there are international standards for the use of lethal force by all law enforcement agencies. For a long time now, the United States at the federal level and at the state level has failed to recognize and abide by these international standards. And it's time that our government be held accountable both to its constitutional protections of all people in the United States, but also to its international legal obligations. Thank you, Eric, for having us in this discussion. Thank you, Margaret. And a big thank you to all of our speakers. You have given us so much to work with and we are grateful for your leadership and, and partnership. Speaking to everyone listening, as, as we bring this briefing to an to a hold or to an end, um, I want to say something very personal. I know folks are tired. It's been a long four years. Uh, my father, who turns 94 in October, uh, reminds me that it has been a long 94 years. Um, we all know what we are witnessing right now. We, we just don't want to say it out loud. Trump has one thing on his mind, election day and he is desperate to hold on to the power of the presidency, a presidency devoted explicitly to not holding up the constitution, but to authoritarian control. He's clear where his power lies. We need to be just as clear where our power lies. 
I believe that this is what it looks like for us at Western State Center. And we invite you to join us or we hope that it inspires you in your own actions. First, as I've already mentioned, the lawsuit we filed in US District Court yesterday with our co-plaintiffs, the First Unitarian Church of Portland, the ACLU Legal Observer, and State Representatives Karen Power and Janelle Bynum. Second, we are inviting allies across the nation to join us in solidarity under the banner, wedefenddemocracy.org. So please stay tuned for an email this afternoon with our new campaign site, with actions you can take and digital content that you can share. I'm especially excited about our symbolic action for folks across the country to demonstrate your solidarity with Portland, Oregon. For example, you'll be able to update your Facebook profile frame and post a rose of the color of your choice on social media and display a rose window sign to show that you are united with Rose City. And of course, we'll continue our ongoing leadership development, working to build the bench of folks working to counter white nationalism, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and gender inequality. This is our choice now, whether we sustain the march towards inclusive democracy, or whether we resign ourselves to the nihilism of authoritarianism. We will see you over at wedefenddemocracy.org. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all for what you do to make things count.